I love these folks. I don't know why they come. Is it, is it warm enough in here? It's warm. It's, it's me. Is it me? Exodus 16. We, we started last week looking at this chapter on, on manna. What is it? And, and we observed how the Lord provided for His people their physical needs for 40 years. And as we looked at the great miracle just from a physical standpoint on how many tons were required to be delivered each and every day, 40 train loads of 10 cars, 10 tons per car, it was just an amazing amount of physical needs were provided by God. We saw that it's a picture of the bread of life, the Bible, that we need for our soul. The manna is the greatest type here in one chapter where just one chapter is placed together devoted to this giving us a picture of what Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God the man is a picture of the bread of God that will feed the soul and we've been studying the similarities spiritually and physically like Jesus said I speak to you of heavenly things I speak to you of earthly things so we look at the earthly and we relate it to the heavenly and we've been working our way through a number of different points and we saw that uh, down in uh, verse uh, 13 that the way the manna came when it was delivered and of verse 13 it said and covered the camp and in the morning the dew lay round about the host in in the morning the the manna was involved or delivered first thing in the morning. God saw to it that when his people awakened in the morning, the provision was there. Now, now he probably could have waited till lunchtime and give him a little time to fast and to think and pray, but he provided right away first thing in the morning the manna. And they were to go out and gather it in the morning and partake of it in the morning. And you know, Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God here, in terms of the word of God, was provided right early in the morning. So the first thing you want to seek in the morning is the word of God. The breakfast of champions is the Bible. It's not Wheaties. You, you know what most people do in the morning? They get up and read the newspaper. You know where the newspaper will be the next day? It'll be in the garbage. It's old news. It's bad news. This is the good news that endureth forever. Better than reading the newspaper is reading the Bible. And you don't have to read a lot of it. It says that uh, the children of, uh, verse 17, the children of Israel uh, gathered, uh, did so, they gathered some more, some less. In other words, the reading portion will vary from person to person. It'll vary based on, on your age in the Lord when you're young. Young children don't eat a lot. When you're older, older people eat a little bit more. It'll also vary based on your level of intellect. God's got all different people with different intellects. Some people may read just a verse a day and meditate on that. Some people will read a chapter a day. Some people will read a book a day. Some more, some less. But the important thing is in the morning, during the day, to get some into you. There was a story I was reading about uh, a man who d determined that he would just uh, read through the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a good book. It's a book about the gifts that God's given unto the church. It's a book about the unity of the church. And of course, that's something we need is unity in our churches. There's so many divisions and fightings. Paul was very upset with the Corinthian church because of all the backbiting. And he said, you're carnal, you're babes. You need to grow up and be a little more spiritual. So he says, I'm going to read through the book of Ephesians. And what he did was, just in the morning, he would read one verse. Just one verse. And he'd meditate on that verse all day long. And you know, he said that one of the things that happened was, the Lord would send someone in his path during the course of that day where some portion of that verse was able to minister to them. The Lord is faithful if we would be faithful. I, I, I'm, I'm always amazed. I see people reading that newspaper. Like, here it is. We've got manna. Newspaper is uh, processed wheat with sugar. Manna is healthy. It's got all the nutrients and all the vitamins for our soul. 
Now he said in verse uh, 4, talking about how he would deliver it, Then said the Lord unto Moses, he says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. That will be my part. I will rain the bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather. In other words, God did his part in delivering it from heaven. There was labor involved for the people, but the labor wasn't to go out and get the word of God. God had delivered the word of God. Their job was to pick it up and avail themselves of it. Once delivered, then all you have to do is just go pick it up and read it. See, God has given the Bible to us. I'll never understand where there are groups of committees trying to rewrite it all the time, as if God hasn't done his job. God says, I will rain the bread from heaven for you. He's done his part. I don't understand why people are arguing about every little word ever studying and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth and doting and questions about words which do not profit. God says, I'll rain it. All you have to do is go out and gather it. Your part is just to go gather personally to yourself. I've done my part. You do your part. The people shall go out and gather it. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Verse 28. Part A. The heart of the righteous studieth. To answer. God says, I will rain the bread from heaven. You go out and your labor is not to obtain it. I've already given it to you. Yours is to take it and study it. The heart of the righteous. Are you righteous? Do you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Do you have the righteousness of God without the law? Then your heart as a righteous person should be to study this thing. To answer. To answer whom? The people around you that have questions about the one true faith that's been delivered to the saints. About what you and I have that the rest of the world is groping, or, uh, groping about in darkness, trying to find a relationship with God. And the only way we can ever assure them is through the words of this book. You know, at the, at the hospital this week, there was a woman talking to me. We had a break. She works as a nurse. And uh, she's dabbled in all kinds of religions. You know, I was a Buddhist and I was a Methodist and now I'm studying this and all that kind of thing. And uh, I, I think she wants to know God. And she says, you know, and I once had a vision from an angel and she was talking to me about that. And I, and I told her, I said, you know, you have to be careful about these things. And I said, let, let, let me show you. And I opened my Bible and, and I pointed her to verses that could answer the very questions that she had. Now, I wouldn't be able to do that had I not spent some time studying so that I knew where to take her. And, and every time she had a you know, question or a concern, I'd say, well, well, you know, let's see what Jesus says about that. Here, read that. What do you think about that? I said, well, you know, and, and, and then I was wondering about, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Here, take a look at that. And, and because of the time studying, I was able to answer her questions with the Word of God. And she wasn't arguing. You could see that the Word of God was speaking to her heart. And she was, I've never seen it like that before. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that. Look at it, it's right there on the page. So God I will, says, I will rain the bread from heaven, but you have to go out and gather. You have to spend some time studying. Study to show thyself approved. Uh, unto God. A workman, you need not be ashamed that you study your Bible. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day, you're still reading through that thing? I said, yep, still reading through it. <laughs> still reading through it. When I get finished, I'll read it again. That's what I do. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer. There's questions out there that people have. This book has the answers. And the answers don't change in this book. That's nice. That's comforting to know that there's an absolute truth. He 
He says in verse 19, back where we were in Exodus 16. When the Lord did his part of bringing the bread every morning, a fresh supply. Verse 19, Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Let no man leave of it till the morning. What happens? Notwithstanding, verse 20, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Now, now here's, here's what the Lord would have us to do. He doesn't want the Bible left on the shelf. He'd like us to partake. Give us this day our daily bread. Is, is that one of the prayers that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount? Now I know so often we think of, you know, give, give us the daily wonder bread or Montana Mills or whatever it is you're thinking. We, we have a physical notation for the verse. But there is a spiritual application to the verse. Yes, our, our body needs to be fed, but we can't live by bread alone. Jesus said that. We need the Word of God to feed our soul. And so when we ask for the daily bread, what we're asking for is, Lord, I'm asking so that when I come to this bread and spend time in it on a daily basis, spiritually you will open my eyes and give me understanding. Spiritually you'll give me something that I can use today to strengthen me this very day. And here's what he's saying here. If you do not use what God gives you on a daily basis, it'll stink. Now, now let me try and put this in a practical term for you. As you and I go through life, the, the Christian's walk is one of trying to go through a world that's in darkness and a world that's surrounded with evil and a world where people are acting after the imaginations of their heart. And, in, and the Christian is trying to walk in the spirit rather than in the flesh. And the spirit will give you something through the word of God, not a word of knowledge apart from the word of God. He will never speak apart from the word of God. The spirit of truth guides you into all truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. He's going to guide you into this. Now, what he's going to see, is, see in you is a particular need you have to grow on a daily basis. He sees the daily growth that's needed. So you might be reading through a particular verse in the scriptures where it says, I was reading one the other night, about um, servants to obey your masters. Now he's talking about, right down here, not with eye, serv not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. In other words, in the workplace, you may get to this verse one day and you're reading and, and the Spirit of God is saying, now I want you to obey your boss today. And this will be the one day when your boss is going to come along with something that you just don't want to obey. And yet, here's what the Holy Spirit is saying. I've given you this manna today to do this today. And if you don't do it right, your testimony will stink. It will stink. In other words, you're to use what I've given you today so that the testimony is a sweet savor today. As opposed to, I just gave you this verse, and now you go forward with it, and you ignore it, and you don't use it, and it breeds worms and it stinks. And the guy, and the guy in the bus will say, what a Christian that guy is. There's some Christian. You see, the Lord had, had operated in the whole, supervened through the whole circumstances that if you just would have applied that verse today, that could have made the difference right there at the workplace, or right there in the home, or right there with the relatives, or right there at the grocery store, or wherever it may be, or at the laundromat, this was the opportunity. And if you don't apply it and you don't use it, then it breeds worms and it stinks. We have a testimony. We have a savor. And it makes an impact on those around us. And if we'll just use the manna, but if we ignore it, I'll do that tomorrow. Some Christian... There's no difference between them and anyone else. They're watching, folks. They're, they're watching us. Sometimes you wish they wouldn't, <laughs> but they do. Daily portion of the manna. Verse 15, back to where we were in, in Exodus. Um, when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna 
for they wist not what it was. Manna, it pretty much defines it in the verse, means what is it? The first time they saw this, it was like, what is this? What, what, what is this? In other words, it was, it was kind of foreign to them. It was, I don't want to use the word incomprehensible to them, because the Bible is not incomprehensible, but it's foreign, it's different. It's like, I remember the first time I looked at it, what is this? This is different than anything I've, I've handled before. And I was not foreign to written material. I mean, like we were joking before, I'm, I'm an indoorsman, you know. I mean, I'm not the kind of guy that, I was like Jacob, one of the guys that dwelled in the tents. I hung around, I read books. I wasn't good at sports. I wasn't good at any outdoor activity. And, and, and my mom used to dress me up like that kid in a Christmas story. I couldn't move my arms when I went out anyways. <laughs> so I, it was ridiculous. So I spent all my time indoors reading books. I was used to books, but the first time I was given the Bible was, this is different. What is this? It's written a different way. By the way, that's one of the ways you and I know the King James Bible is the Word of God. The King James Bible is different than other things that are masquerading as Bibles out there. They read like a newspaper. They read like a novel. They read like a bebop adventure. They read like I don't know what. You know, put it in the contemporary language. Yeah, because God didn't give it to you. That's man changing it. But you get the real man. It's like, this is different. Well, sure, it's from heaven. It's not going to be like something manufactured on earth. It's going to be, it's going to have a different flavor to it. A different scent to it. It's going to read a different way. You won't be able to read it on your own. You need the Spirit of God to guide you into it. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are spiritually discerned. You have to read it. I'll tell you how you have to read it. Um, let me see. I had this in one of my notes. Maybe we got, maybe we read it last week, but it, it talked about they went out, uh, it lay round about the host, and it says they, they, the children uh, gathered it, and one of the ways they gathered it was on the ground, verse 14. In other words, the manna didn't come in trees where they reached and picked it like this. And it didn't fall on tree stumps where they could get it standing up. It was on the ground. The best way to gather it was getting down, maybe on your knees. The point is, to get down is a, is a form of humility. And one of the ways you understand the manna is with a humble heart, rather than with a haughty mind and a proud attitude. And so you come to this book, and if you come to it with a, with a high-minded attitude, don't be surprised if you don't understand the teachings in here. Or even worse, if you understand them wrong and put a natural interpretation on them. That's why there's so much problem down here. You know, people say, I don't understand why there's so many denominations. Why are there so many churches? I don't understand how, how so many people can read this book and come up with so many different things because they're reading it with a natural mind. If people would get down on their knees in humility and ask God to interpret it, we'd all come away with God's interpretation. And God's interpretation doesn't change on this book. We, we, need, we need humility. And when we don't have humility and we don't have the Spirit of God, what is this? This is a different flavor. It is manna. It is manna. Now, I will tell you something interesting. Turn in Numbers chapter 11. I'm going to show you something. A little bit further on in the book of Numbers, uh, God begins to record the journeys of the children of Israel as they go through the 40-year wilderness event. 40 years in the wilderness. And as they're going through the wilderness, the wilderness journeys are hard. We've been through them. Sometimes we uh, murmur and complain. And notice what happens, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them, among the children of Israel, they fell a lusting. It's the mixed multitude that's beginning this lustful murmuring. And then it says, And the children of Israel also wept again. So the mixed multitude start the problem, and the children of Israel follow along. Sometimes this happens. You know, one person starts with an attitude, and 
and starts complaining at work and then someone else picks up and I go, yeah, yeah, he's right. And then a few other people follow it. It just took one person to start. Here the mixed multitude are starting a problem. <clears throat> and, and here's what the uh, mixed multitude is uh, upset about. Uh, verse 6. But now as our soul dried away, there's, there's nothing um, at all be, beside this manna before our eyes. They did not like the manna. They, they, they couldn't stand the manna. The mixed multitude turned against the manna. There was another verse, I think, uh, that mentions this in, in the book of Exodus later on, too. But it's talking about the, they did not want the manna. They wanted to turn back. As a matter of fact, it says, uh, uh, who shall give us flesh to eat? Remember the fish that we did eat in Egypt. Uh, freely and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic now our soul is dried away there's nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes and the manna was as coriander seed and the color is the color of bdellium but they couldn't stand the manna they loathed the manna the spiritual man loves the manna the old man the flesh man from Egypt loves the old things and if you've been born again, you have two natures. You have a new nature, spirit born. You have an old nature, your first birth from the flesh. And, and what the Lord doesn't want you to do is follow the mixed multitude into loathing the manna and turning back to the old things. Now, now what I'm talking about here are specifically things that have to do in your relationship with God. I do not know where you came from in terms of your religious past. Hopefully you came as an atheist. <laughs> then you had no relationship with God. And so there was no fish and onions and garlic to fall back on. But, but if you come from an old religious system where you were eating fish and onions and garlic from Egyptian religions and old religions, you have to be careful because what happens is over many, many, many years of, of following that religious system and eating that particular food, your old flesh is comfortable with that. And when you get born again, God wants to feed you with manna. He doesn't want you turning back to those old ways. One of the most grievous things I see is a born-again Christian, they receive Jesus as their Savior in sincerity of heart. And they don't get grounded in the Word of God. They don't get good teaching in the Word of God, and they fall back into the old religion. And I have met born-again Christians going to old churches, and I asked them, I said, but brother, sister, you know, let's just talk frank. Did you get saved at that church? Oh, no. No, I was at a crusade, and I got saved. No, I, an evangelist came to me. A guy came to my house, and I got saved. No, I read a track one day, and I got saved. I said, then why would you want to go back to that Egyptian form of religion that never got you saved in the first place. Well, you know, my family's always gone there and I didn't know where to go and I'm comfortable and... Strange. Strange. And it's the mixed multitude, the unsaved people that loathe the manna. And Lord wants to be careful you don't follow them. He wanted His children to love the manna. And I don't see why they wouldn't. I mean, it was as coriander seed the color was as bdellium. Look at eight. It tells you how they did it. The people went about. They gathered it. They ground it in mills. They beat it in a mortar. They baked it in pans. They made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Fresh oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The taste of this manna, this King James Bible, is the taste of fresh oil. By the way, I, I, I often, you know, test people. <laughs> I, I tell them, you know, I say, you, you know, Everyone will tell you everything is the Bible nowadays. But I'm telling you the King James Bible is the Word of God. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes. We, Joe, we have time. I can do this study real quick. But, but the King James Bible, I tell you, if you will spend 30 days just reading from a King James Bible, put the other stuff away. Just spend 30 days reading the Psalms in a King James Bible. And then after 30 days, try and read the other stuff. And you know what you'll find? That King James Bible's fresh oil. The Holy Spirit's all over it. You try and read one of the, you read the Psalms in some other Bible. After 30 days of reading the Psalms in the King James Bible, you'll know the fresh oil is right here. You'll know it's right here. 
I'll finish, I want to sh finish a few more things. Go back to where we were in uh, Exodus 16 and look at verses uh, 32 through 34. The mixed multitude. They couldn't stand it. The mixed multitude. By the way, think about this. They were a multitude mixed in with God's people. I mean, here's the children of Israel. They're on the march from Egypt to the Holy Land. God is leading them, and there's a mixed multitude of Egyptians mingled in with them on the trip. You know what that's a picture of? Jesus gave that picture in Matthew 13. He said there are wheat and there are tares. And the tares almost look like the wheat. That's a picture of professing Christians that hate the Bible. You've got to wonder about them. I was, we were, my wife and I, we used to do door-to-door -door ministry in our own neighborhood, going around passing out tracks in our neighborhood. And uh, we, we came upon a house in the neighborhood. We knocked on the door, and the gentleman opened the door, and, uh, oh, you're Christians. And, yeah, we're Christians. And, and we got to talking a little bit. And he says, you know, I go to such and such a church. And we said, oh, that's great, brother. And, you know, uh, we said, you know what we're trying to do, though? You could help us out, uh, we said to this gentleman. You could really help us out. We're trying to win some of the folks in the neighborhood to the Lord. And uh, we're not having a lot of success door to door. So what we're thinking of doing is uh, putting out some flyers and having a home Bible study. Because home Bible study is less threatening than coming to a church. Sometimes it's hard to bring someone to a church. But a home Bible study, you know, you got the coffee and the donuts. You're just sitting around. And we put a flyer out there. Are you concerned about how to raise your kids? And, you know, things like that. We're going to do a home Bible study. And uh, we told them, we said, we put this flyer out and we haven't gotten many responses. But since you live in the neighborhood with us, you know, if we could just get a couple of folks to get it started. So we got like a little group. People will be less afraid to come, you know, rather than to be the first ones at the party. And he said, well, you know, he said, uh, I don't like Bible study. Bible study's not for me. I go to church once a week. That's plenty for me. Professing Christian, mixed multitude, doesn't like the manna. <clears throat> so we never were able to get anyone else to come. <laughs> it was a failed effort. A mixed multitude. Uh, anyways, Exodus 16. The tares. Exodus 16. So here's how it ends. Verse 32. Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations as the Lord commanded Moses. So Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of Canaan. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. They, everyone had an omer five pints. An omer is five pints. An ephah is 51 pints. And so everybody got their five pints of manna a day. Now, an omer was to be kept. This is said three times here. An omer to be kept for your generations in the testimony. Put it before the testimony. Verse 34 with a capital T. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. As they traveled on the wilderness journeys, the tabernacle would be set there. The pillar of fire would move. They would take the tabernacle up. They would follow the pillar of fire. The pillar of fire would come down. They would set the tabernacle up, and they would set it up according to God's design. And in the most holy place, Hebrews chapter 9, Verse 2, for there was a tabernacle. Hebrews 9, 2, there was a tabernacle. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That's the holy place. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now here was the place where God's spirit resided in the holiest of all or the most holy place. What was in there? Which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant laid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. 
So in the most holy place, there was God's Spirit, the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat, and the golden pot with the manna. And inside, under the mercy seat, were the Ten Commandments. And this was in the most holy place. Now, remember what happened? You left it outside for one day. It would breed worms and it would stink. And now inside this golden pot is manna placed next to the mercy seat. And for 40 years, it's kept fresh in the presence of God. What could not last one day in a man's tent was preserved in the presence of the ark. The ark is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, what you and I read in this book, and we can't keep it for a day. You ever feel that way? I don't know about you, but I don't think there's a day goes by where I, where I don't get on my knees at the end of the day and say, Lord, I messed up again. You know, I just, I messed up. I mean, I'm sorry. I messed up. I didn't mean to. You know, and it's usually something particular. I say, you know, with so-and-so, I, I messed up. You know, I said something I shouldn't have said. With so-and-so, I didn't do something I should have did. Was, I mean, every day. The very manna that God feeds me with, I can't seem to keep it going. And in the presence of Jesus Christ, not one jot, nor one tittle was broken. It was preserved entirely. Jesus can live the Christian life. You and I can't. Which is why he wants to live it in us and through us. We can't do this in our own strength. We need the manna. We need the spirit and we need prayer. And still then, we're going to fall short. A just man falleth seven times, but riseth up again. We don't stay down. We're like Rocky. <laughs> we get knocked down, but we get up. Ain't so bad. And we get up. Adrian. I mean, but that's, that's what we are. But you know what? We need to point people to the ark, to Jesus. But the picture is right there. What can't last a day in our tent preserved forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let me show you something else that's real interesting. And you might want to keep your finger in Hebrews because we're going to go back and forth between Hebrews and Exodus. I'm going to show you something. I was reading through Exodus and I observed some things. This particular chapter, all about the manna. And curiously, in the fourth verse, the Lord says unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. The Lord's desire is to feed us, not just physically, much more important spiritually. And the Lord does his part, God is faithful and keeps his word. And he says this, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them, whether they will walk in my law or no. And then he says in the fifth verse, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it on the sixth day shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And he makes this statement about the sixth day. There will be twice as much bread as on any other day. Now, we went through and we saw that every day the Lord rained an omer of manna for every person in the camp. But on the sixth day, he rained a double portion. He rained two omers on the sixth day. And the seventh was the Sabbath, and he didn't rain anything on the Sabbath day. And what they were able to do was, they were able to use one half of the sixth day for day six and the other half of, that came on the sixth day for day seven. So we saw historically what was happening there. But it's curious, there's a little pattern being set up here. He says it in verse five. It shall come to pass on the sixth day, okay, at the end, it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. He says that, and notice he not only says it once, 
he repeats it in verse 22, and it came to pass on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And then he repeats it in verse 29. See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Three times the Lord makes this statement that on the sixth day he's going to give a double portion. Now, a couple places very quickly. Job chapter 24. Job chapter 24. Where's my... Job chapter 24, verse 1. Good question. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know Him not see His days? A good question being asked here is, he said, look it, God knows what He's going to do. The Almighty knows what His plans are. Then why is it that they that know Him can't see it? Why don't you seem to have, you and I who know the Almighty, seem to have an understanding of the big picture of what God's doing? I mean, why? Seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty. He knows what His days are. He knows what He's going to do. Why don't we seem to know it? Why do we not see His days, His times? Not like 24-hour days, but the big picture days. What is, what, like what? Psalm 90. Moses. We were talking about Moses, weren't we? Turn to Psalm 90. This is the psalm written by Moses. Psalm 90. The prayer of Moses, the man of God. Verse 4. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. He's speaking about the Lord. First word of the psalm. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. He's talking to the Lord. Moses is talking to the Lord and he's saying, when I look at the things you do, a thousand years to you is like one day. A thousand years are as yesterday. Peter makes that clear in his epistle in the back of the Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, going, now, now, now we're beginning to see God's time. God's time is uh, a little more drawn out than ours. All right? God is the God of eternity. We are a, a creature of the moment. We live for but a short time, like a vapor, a mist, and we pass away. And, and to us, 70 years is long, and 70 years, it's like a less than an hour in one of God's days. It's nothing to God. God's days are a thousand years. So if we look at it this way, all of a sudden, knowing what we know about the creation, starting back here, at the time of creation... Creation is 4,000 B.C. One day, we're at 3,000 B.C. Two days, now we're at 2,000 B.C. Three days, we're at 1,000 B.C. Four days, and here's the time when the Lord comes in Calvary's cross, where B.C. crosses into A.D. And here it is, right here, right at the crossover point. And now we go from B.C. to A.D., Five days, 1,000 A.D. Six days, 2,000 A.D. We're living right around this time. And now we understand, those of us who have studied carefully the Lord's work, and knowing that you've got to give yourself a couple decades either way. After all, Jesus Christ died on the cross a few decades after this crossover point here. But we understand the seventh day is going to be the day of rest. It's going to be the Sabbath day. It's going to be the millennial day when Jesus comes back to take over this planet. And it's very curious. The Lord says, I'm going to rain heaven from you, a bread from heaven. And he says, on the sixth day, I will give you twice as much bread on the sixth day. Now, that's curious. I look down 
and I see over this period of time he rained down something known as the Old Testament. And then over here, after the Lord uh, death, burial, and resurrection, he reigned the New Testament. And then he says on the sixth day, I'm going to reign twice as much for you. Now, if I remember correctly, the Old Testament was in Hebrew. And the New Testament was in Greek. Now notice where he says this to The first time he clues you in on this is on verse 5. Verse 5. Exodus 16, verse 5. Going back to where we were. It shall come to pass on the sixth day, it shall be twice as much. And verse 5. Now, if you remember Bible math, 5 is the number of grace. God is going to do something gracious for us. Twice as much bread on the sixth day. Isn't that interesting? Exodus 16. Now, people tell me all the time, well, you know, the Bible in the originals, the Hebrew and the Greek. First off, I want to say something to you. The originals weren't on earth. The originals were in heaven. Okay? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The originals have never been on earth. All that's ever been on earth are copies of what's in heaven. When God spake to Moses, he wrote a copy down of what was in heaven. When God spake to Paul, Paul wrote a copy down of what was in heaven. The originals have never been on earth. They've always been safekeeping in heaven. God wouldn't trust man with the originals. <laughs> we'd destroy them. We'd ruin them. The Word of God's been in heaven. He has rained down for us and allowed us to put things on paper down here. And originals always get messed up. We'll see a few chapters later. Uh, Moses is going to have the first copy of the Ten Commandments. You know what he's going to do? He's going to break them. So God doesn't, he's not too worried about copies. Give him another copy, Moses. So it's the first thing, put this original thing aside. But, but the thing is this. You know, the Hebrew and the Greek, and after all, English is just a translation. You know translation's a Bible word? At least in a King James Bible. Did you know that? Go to Hebrews chapter... 11. I want to show you something. Hebrews 11 is a great chapter. It's all about faith. It's the roll call of faith. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith, verse 1, is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Why is that? Verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. By grace are you saved through, through sacraments. <laughs> through church membership. Through baptism. Wrong, wrong. By grace are you saved through faith. Right? Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Not of works. It's by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. All God wants out of a human being is to believe what God said. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of, the Word of God. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Something material. Are you hanging? There it is. And notice, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He was not found because God hath translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. There's the word translated in your Bible. The, the word translated only f is, is only found, any form of it, is only found five times in your Bible. Remember I told you five, grace? Five. It's only five times. Three of them are in this verse. One other time it's in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel. And one other time it's in the New Testament, Colossians. Let's see, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. There's one form of it. The New Testament was written in Greek, Colossians. And here's the book of Hebrews. And three times in one verse we see this. And the only time you ever see the word translation, translation is found right here 
in this verse, the fifth verse. Now, I went back to, keep your finger there, keep your finger there, and go back to Exodus 16. And I noticed it was in verse 5, he says, I'm going to give you a double portion on the sixth day. The sixth day is sometime between 1000 A.D. and 2000 A.D. He's going to give us a double portion. Let's see, there was one portion in Hebrew and a double portion, another Omer, in Greek. And God's going to bring them across and translate them into English and give me a double portion. So now I'll have an Old Testament in English and a New Testament in English. As I bring them both across, and it's going to be done somewhere in this day, the sixth day. A double portion is going to be given to us. Now, curious, go back in Exodus 16. Do you know what? This whole chapter on manna doesn't start in verse 1. You ever read your Bible? If you've got paragraph markings, look at verse 1. It's got nothing to do with the manna. Verse 2 has got nothing to do with the manna. Verse 3 has got nothing to do with the manna. And verse 4 has a paragraph marking. The whole chapter about the manna starts in the fourth verse of the 16th chapter. 16.4. Do you know when they commissioned, when King James commissioned the translation of the Bible was in 1604. 1604. That's when the commissioning for the King James Bible was. 1604. It was finished in 1611. Verse 11 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses. And here's the Lord speaking unto us. Now watch this. Remember I told you verse 5? He says, I'll give you a double portion. Verse 5. Where was, um, what verse was it that talked about translation? Anybody remember what verse it was? In Hebrews? Go back to Hebrews. Anybody find that in Hebrews, in the back of your Bible? Hebrews. What verse was it? So, the translation, verse 5. The mention of the double portion, verse 5. Uh, what chapter in Exodus were we in? What chapter in Hebrews are you in? That's, that's a strange coincidence. That's a strange coincidence. God could have picked any verse. And there's the hookup. The double portion of translation, verse 5, Exodus 16, Hebrews 11. That's your 1611 Bible. That's when God rained down a double portion of bread on the sixth day for us. Isn't that a blessing? If that's a coincidence, that's a strange one. A lot of strange coincidences in that book. Go oh, yeah, brother. In the New Testament, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, it starts within the beginning. And if you start from there, from the Gospel of John, and you count John, Acts, Romans, you get to Hebrews, it's the 16th book from that, in the beginning of John. Amen. Chapter Amen. 11 of Hebrews. Amen. 1611. Amen. Amen, brother. That's another good one. And one other thing, let me just show you something. Turn to when Jesus was in the wilderness temptation. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. The Lord Jesus Christ being tempted of the devil. And by the way, there's a lot of names given to the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Do you know one of, the, one of the names given that we mention a lot that is found in John's Gospel in the first chapter? He's known as the Word of God. Jesus Christ with a capital W. Jesus Christ is the Word of God with a capital W. Of course, the Word of God with a little w equals the Bible. This is a person. This is a book. This one speaks, this one is written, although it speaks to us. And Jesus is in the wilderness, he's got the devil. And they're going head to head, and here's how he answers him. Verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written. Verse 10, Jesus said unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. Now, now I don't know about you, <laughs> If I were Jesus Christ and the devil standing face to face with me and I happen to be this, I'd say, hey, Satan, get thee hence. I'm the Word of God with a capital W. 
Don't mess with me. But Jesus set aside his glory and elevated this. He elevated the Bible to set a pattern for you and me that we can always count on that which is written. But you know what's curious? How many times did he say it's written there? Three times. Three times. It is written. Hebrew. It is written. Greek. It is written. English. It's written. God does things in threes. Those are his fingerprints. All right, next week we'll uh, come to the 17th chapter and we'll start to see the, the wanderings of the children of Israel. Any more questions than what we looked at tonight? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, perfect, pure, holy King James Bible that is written, the bread from heaven. It's manna. The mixed multitude doesn't like it, Lord. But help your people to love it. And help us every day to go out and gather a small amount. And Lord, give us a testimony, I pray, for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.